find them when they're young. Uh, so. Okay. All right, we're going to be in Luke 9. Um, Luke 9. It is incredibly rare, very, very rare that I change a message at the last minute, especially after I had most of the original message completed. Um, and yet, that's what we're going to be doing this morning, because during this week, God had been dealing with me on a specific topic that we've talked about many, many times in the past, but I think it's absolutely essential for us to hear again. Let me say this. I've never been more excited where God is taking us as a church, the things that he has in store for us as a church, the incredible doors that God, are op God is opening for us this year that we've never imagined a year ago or two years ago. There's some challenges of space and facility that we're facing that in the big picture is a sign of God's faithfulness to us as a church body. Look around the people that are sitting in this room. We come from all different backgrounds. We come from we all have different stories. We come, uh, some of us, we didn't grow up in this faith tradition, but in God's grace and kindness, we encountered Jesus. Others of us, we grew up in a tradition where we knew and loved Jesus even from a young age, and um, we've been in church our entire lives. The potential that's in this room, the gifts, the talents that are in this room, the leaders that God has brought to our church is incredible. And lately, I've been put in a lot of conversations where I've been sharing the story of our church in different settings, different contexts, and even just this week, I had the um, opportunity to share our story from our beginnings, meeting in our um, living room of our house, all the way till now, four different times to four different people in four different contexts. And one of those conversations, that one of the guys just stopped at the end and said, hey, what's your biggest worry? What's your biggest prayer for your church body? And it took me a second to think through that, and ultimately it got to where, what I want to share this morning, because my immediate instinct was, we're out of space, we need more space. And as I thought about that, that's not the biggest worry I have for us. That's not the biggest concern I have. It's not that we're not even a church body, because I think we're super close as a body. I remember like four years ago, I, we had one set of keys here, it was me. Um, and at 12.30, I could lock the doors. Now, like, probably a half of you have church keys because <laughs> some of you guys don't want to leave church afterward. And I'm like, I'm not sitting around for you anymore. You guys, one of you lock up whenever you need to get out of here. Um, and that's, that's on you. If you're not getting close to people here, um, can I honestly say that's not on the church body. That's probably because of your own hesitation because people love to hang out together. People love to be in community together. Most people, like I said, we're kicking people out of here. Um, I'm not even concerned that we don't do missions and outreach. We get that. Most of you have stepped up and gotten involved in various different aspects of church. I mean, I talk to other pastors and they're like, we can't find volunteers for anything. And I'm like, most of our folks volunteer for something or another. I don't have the problems that some of these guys are facing. So that's not an issue for me. I'm not overly concerned about our finances. God has been faithful to provide what we need, when we need it, and above and beyond what we need here locally, which has enabled us to be able to bless and help plant churches all over the world. That wasn't an option for us several years ago, but we're in a place where we say, God, you have blessed us so that we could be a blessing to others. But here's my biggest concern, here's my biggest worry, that are we simply going through the motions? Or are we really becoming disciples of Jesus? And are we making disciples of Jesus? Am I as a pastor simply content with folks simply attending church on a weekly basis and saying, oh man, my church is full, we're doing well? Or are we producing disciples who are committed to following Jesus fully committed to following Jesus with all their hearts, their souls, their minds, their strength, their lives. See, that's probably the biggest worry I have because I read passages like in Hebrews where it says that as a shepherd that I have to give account for your souls, that I am going to give account for whether you are pursuing Jesus or not. And so 
that's a burden that's heavy, and that's a burden that can be, that's a task that can be easily deceptive, right? Because it's easy to think that we're doing well because of good numbers, diversity, the kids are great, the facility, the funds, that we could use those to gauge if we're a successful church or not. But at the end of the day, God isn't interested in any of those metrics as much as he's interested in seeing hearts and lives transformed by the power of the gospel that become radically different in their love and pursuit of Jesus. That's what worries me the most. That's what I pray about more than anything else. Not that you'll get good jobs. You'll get it. God's faithful. Not that you'll have good health. God will take care of you. Your, the word says, not a hair of your head is going to fall unless Jesus knows about it. That's not a big concern. But my biggest prayer, my biggest concern is, are you following Jesus? Are you pursuing Jesus? Or are you simply content by showing up here on Sunday morning and saying, done that, finished that, I'm good, and now I'm going to live my own life the way I want to live during the week. This is what wasn't what I was planning to preach on this morning. Um, I told the worship team of a small series that I was going to be thinking about, and then I changed that. And then even after changing that, I was still restless about the topic this week. And I think it was because God wanted me to sit and wrestle with this guy in the conversation that I had with this guy. So yesterday morning, I sat down and threw out the sermon that I had and started working on this new sermon. And hopefully it makes sense because this has been a long week, but I'm praying that through just these few thoughts from this passage that God would speak to our hearts and convict us that just showing up here on Sunday morning is not enough. So if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, can I encourage you that this has to be your passion, that you would want to become a disciple of Jesus, that you would want to become like Jesus. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, let me say first and foremost, I'm not interested in making you a Christian. That is not my interest at all. That's simply a label. And labels in our day and age mean nothing. Many people who have labeled themselves as Christians out there are anything but followers of Jesus. So I have no interest in making you a Christian, but I want, you to invite, I want to invite you on a journey with me to see who Jesus is. And in doing so, I want to invite you to become a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. See, I strongly believe that when you see how amazing Jesus is, when you experience his love for you, you will, not, you will want to become a disciple of Jesus. And if that's you, can I just say, I'm so glad you're here. You're not here by accident. God has brought you here this morning. Our text here is Luke 9. I'm not going to read the entire passage, but I invite you this, when you go home today, read Luke, Luke 9, the entire chapter, because it's a lot of really, really good stories here. But I'm going to cover three different sections in here. The first eight chapters of the book of Luke really show us who Jesus is. And yet, here in chapter 9, Peter recognizes that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the one who is bringing the ruling power of God back into the world to heal, repair the brokenness in this world, spiritual brokenness, psychological brokenness, social brokenness, physical brokenness. And you see Jesus doing that throughout the book of Luke. And from the moment that Jesus' identity is revealed, we find Jesus beginning to say these words to his people, follow me. And so if Jesus is really who he says he is, what does it mean to follow him? I want to share three things with you from Luke 9 about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Being his disciple means three things. Number one, it means having a new priority, having a new identity, living in a new mercy. So three things. Number one, new priority. First of all, being a disciple of Jesus means you set a new priority. Look with me at verses 57 to 62. As we were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus told him, foxes have dens and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And then he said to another, follow me. Lord, he said, first let me go bury my father. But he told him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and spread the good news of the, spread the news of the kingdom of God. And another said, I'll follow you, Lord. But first, let me go and say goodbye to those at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
It's fascinating that all three of these men don't say no to Jesus. They're like, I'll follow you. One even initiates the conversation and comes to Jesus and say, I'll go wherever you tell me to go. They're willing to follow Jesus, and yet Jesus responds to them in a rather blunt way. The first one, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, foxes are foals, birds of the airs have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And it says, as if Jesus was saying, there's nothing wrong with what you just said and your desire to follow me. There's nothing wrong with it. But I discern this wrong attitude that's underlying your reason for wanting to follow me. Do you understand what kind of savior I am? I'm not the one that rallies constituents or pulls together families and then triumphs and overcomes the nation. I'm a savior who saves by being condemned through dying through giving my heart to be broken. He goes, let's apply this to one area of your life. I see you have a nice home, a nice standard of living. Are you willing to put me before that? Are you willing to say, God, if I lose everything, I'll still follow me. Are you willing to follow me, not out of convenience, but sacrificially follow me no matter what? Are you willing to not just follow me when you have time or when it's convenient or when you enjoy what you're being asked to do, but are you willing to make me a priority over anything and everything and anyone else? Are you willing to say that maybe it, you're following Jesus because, man, following Jesus looks good or it feels good or Jesus will bless me, but are you willing to follow me if it means it might not be a blessing to you? I've shared this before. There's a theology out here that says the moment you come to Jesus, everything is going to be great for you, right? Um, that you're going to be blessed, you're going to be prosperous, you're going to have more money than you can imagine. You can have money to buy planes and cars and Lamborghinis or whatever you want. And there's, it's a theology that says it's God is just there to bless you. It's like this lottery machine. Um, and that's what God is. But friends, that's not in the Bible. And that theology, I've said this before, if that theology only works in North America, in our country, it probably isn't God's theology. Because right now, in places like in China and in India, when people come to Jesus, they're not getting blessings, they're getting disowned. They're, get, they're dying for their faith. They're being kicked out, their churches are being burned, their homes are being burned. And are you saying that they've missed God because they pursued Jesus? Because they didn't get the blessing? I would say that they're probably better followers of Jesus than we are in our safety and our luxury because they've counted the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. And they've said, okay, even if it costs my life, pursuing Jesus is worth it. And Jesus says, it's not about convenience. It's not about time. It's not about um, fitting me into your schedule. I want all of you. And then Jesus talks to these two other men, both of whom have genuine concerns about their family. One says, man, I'd love to follow you, but... I need to go bury my dad, my father first. The other says, absolutely, I'll follow you, but I need to go say goodbye to my family first. Listen, there's absolutely nothing wrong with both of those requests. But behind those requests, Jesus sees the wrong attitude of heart. He says, I know you. For you to specifically go back home would be a bad idea. I've got to come first. Notice the language of both of these men. Lord, first let me do this. And Jesus is saying, there can't, be any, there can't be any but first. It has to be first Jesus, then everything else. This is why he says that no man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. See, anyone who works in the field must be completely focused on the field. And following Jesus, friends, isn't any different. A disciple of Jesus must be focused on Jesus. It means waking up and saying, Jesus, what do you want to do with me today? Who do you want me to bless today? Who do you want me to serve today? How do you want me to live my life today? How do I honor Jesus with my work today? How do I honor Jesus in parenting today? How do I reflect Jesus toward my children today? How do I reflect Jesus in how I love my wife today? Jesus, how do my life reflect you? See, he's, he's saying that, by the way, that phrase, fit for the kingdom, really isn't one of the best translations. He isn't saying that unless you're totally committed, you don't qualify God's kingdom. That's not what he's saying. Because the truth is none of us qualify for God's kingdom. It is purely by God's grace and God's grace alone. 
What he's saying is that unless delighting in Jesus, resembling Jesus, serving Jesus, knowing Jesus is your highest priority, unless that is what you live for, the healing power of God's kingdom will not flow through your life. You'll simply go through the motions. You will not be a useful vehicle for God's kingdom. To the person who wants to bury his father, Jesus tells him, let the dead bury the dead. Obviously, dead people can't bury dead people. But Jesus must be talking to spiritually dead people. To be spiritually dead means to be blind and insensitive to who God is and how he's working. You may be here and you're saying, I believe in Jesus, but right now I'm not in a season where I can put him first. I've got work on the line. I've got family. I've got to wait till my kids get older. I have to wait till my parents die. I've got to wait till I graduate. I see who Jesus is. I see what he's done, but I can't put him first in my life right now because of all these other priorities. I will someday, but just not today. Life is too busy to add Jesus in. And and when someone says that, I understand Christianity and everything that Jesus has done, but I'm not just ready to put Jesus as the center of my life, then can I tell you that you don't really understand it at all. Jesus says, putting anything before me reveals spiritual deadness in your life. And I know that sounds harsh, but here's what Jesus is saying. Let the dead bury the dead. No one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I need to be the first priority in your life or you're really not my disciple. If you don't put me first in your life, if that's not what you're committed to, if not, it's not that you're just uncommitted or lazy or disorganized or undisciplined, you just don't get it. You don't really see who I am and what I've done. You don't understand the meaning of my life and my work, and you need friends to wake up. That's what Jesus is saying. Let me illustrate. On Friday, Sean back there, Sean and I have the joy of working together, and Sean came to my office on Friday and knocked on my door. Um, part of me uh, was like, oh, man, he's going to bother me with more stuff to do, right? And so part of me was like, go away, Sean. But it would have been weird for me to say, you know what, come in, Sean, but stay out Templeton, right? It's a bit of a problem because Sean's his first name, Templeton is his last name, right? It's, I can't separate them. It's not that the top half is Sean, and that's the lovable type, and the bottom half is Templeton, and that's not that lovable, because if I don't get Templeton, I don't get Sean. If I'm going to keep Templeton out, he doesn't come in at all. That's a stupid illustration that I couldn't think of a better illustration, but um, (laughs) for us to make the statement, Jesus, come into my life, forgive my sins, answer my prayers, do this for me, bless me this way. But then I don't want you to be the absolute master of my life. Jesus, Savior, come in, but Jesus, Lord, stay out. Is basically saying, Sean, come in, Templeton, stay out. Because Jesus is not one or the other, he's both. He's both Savior and Lord, and you can't have one or the other. There's some people that think, oh, Jesus is my Savior, but then I can live my own way and do my own thing. But friends, that doesn't work that way. He has got to be both your Savior and your Lord because he didn't save you simply to get you to heaven. He saved you so that your life would be radically transformed where you are living now to the march of a different drummer. And that drummer is Jesus. That's what he's calling you to. You can't intellectually say, yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, I believe he died for my sins. But then say, no, you know what? Jesus is just there for Sundays. You can't do that. He's got to be the center of your life. You may think you understand everything about Jesus, but you really don't. It's not just a matter of a lack of commitment or a lack of disciplined friends. If that's you, I hate to say this, but you're spiritually dead. And the only thing that can wake you up is the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you deceive yourself into thinking that you're saved, you may today the Holy Spirit speak to you and say, you need to repent. You need to wake up. It's number two, a new identity. Discipleship is not just a matter of making Jesus your priority. It's also melting your heart to a new shape. It's not simply about shifting priorities. It's finding a new identity. Go back with me to verse 23. It's another story here. Jesus said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross daily. Let him follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the entire world, the whole world, and yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and the holy angels. 
Truly, I tell you, there's some standing here that will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Listen, if you understand all that Jesus has done for you, the one thing you don't want to hear is that the Son of Man is ashamed of you. You don't want that. If you truly understand what Jesus has done, you want to hear the other words that Jesus says will be said over you. Well done, good and faithful servant. See, I think that really determines your passion for Jesus. Are you living for those words, well done? Or are you living for those words, ah, you did okay, but I'm not, you really haven't lived your life for me. The word life there isn't referring to physical life. It's talking about self. It's talking about a radically new inner life that affects how you live outwardly. Your old way of having an identity of gaining a sense of self has to end. We just did a whole series on this. In the sense, you have to die to it. And when you die to it, Jesus gives you a new identity. You'll get a whole new each self. Verse 25 says, what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? Gaining things from the world is the normal way we try to live and find our identity. Some people say your identity is found in what kind of career you have. And so you, when you ask you, who are you? You immediately identify with your, with your career. Others think their identity is in, found in a good family. Some find identity in the form of level of education we complete. But Jesus is saying, even if you get all of that, even if you get a good family and a good job and a good education and your family's great, your kids are great, even if you get all of that at the end of it, it will not give you a stable life. But if you lose yourself for me, in other words, instead of trying to gain your identity by who you know and what you possess, build everything in your life on me, on who I am and what I've done, then you will finally have a true self that is stable because, friends, you were created to know God. And here's the thing. Jesus says, if you would seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and if you would put Jesus above everything else, his promise to you is that he'll take care of all the other details of his life. But our, we flipped it around. We say, I'll take care of all the details of my life, and then I'll give time for Jesus. And you work yourself to death and you'll get one thing and then realize that doesn't satisfy you. And then so you'll trade that in for something else and realize that doesn't satisfy you. But Jesus says, if you would pursue me with everything that you have, if you would seek first my kingdom and seek first my righteousness and seek first my desires for your life, and then all these other things you're worried about, I'll take care of those details for you. And you will not burn out because your identity and your satisfaction is found in who I am and what I've done. And all these other things are just things to just... Just there for you. They're just there. And so if it's gone, you don't burn out. If it disappears or it breaks down in the middle of the road, you're okay. Because it was just a tool that God has blessed you with. See, a disciple isn't just someone. We'll dive, we'll dive more into gospel identity here in a few weeks. But So we won't spend too much time on this topic because there's a lot to say on identity. But a disciple isn't someone who has new priorities in life but it's someone whose entire identity has been reshaped and forged. And then you got to ask the question, how is that possible? That's the third point, new mercies. The key to setting new priorities, the key to having new mercies, I mean, new identity, is living in a new mercy. Go down to verse 51. When the days were coming close for him to be taken up, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of himself, and on the way, they entered the village of the Samaritans to make preparation for him. But they didn't welcome him, because he was determined to journey to Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? I love them. And he, <laughs> and he turned and he rebuked them, and they went to another village. Hey, Jesus, let's just burn these people down left and right. <laughs> My kind of people. Um, here's the logic of the disciples. Um, there was a prophet in the Old Testament named Elijah that would call fire down from heaven on some soldiers who were seeking to arrest him. And so they're not 
This is not bad theology. They've actually read about this, right? Um, and the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration saw that Jesus was actually greater than Elijah. And so logically, if Jesus is greater than Elijah and these people are rejecting Jesus, what's wor that's worse than being rejected, rejecting Elijah. So let's bring that fire down. Let's burn them. Let's consume them. Let's show it's not, it's not a good idea to reject Jesus. But here's the kicker. The one that rejected Jesus were the Samaritans. But Jesus doesn't rebuke the Samaritans. He actually turns around and rebukes James and John and rebukes the disciples. And it wasn't just the Samaritans that Jesus doesn't seek to rebuke or destroy. In a few chapters, you get to the Garden of Gethsemane, and soldiers come to arrest Jesus. What does Jesus do there? He heals the ear of an enemy that, whose ear was cut off. And later on, these soldiers are nailing his hands to a feet, his hands to the cross and his feet to the cross. And what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them because they really don't understand what they're doing. Why doesn't fire come down on the Samaritans? Why doesn't fire come down on the soldiers at the cross? The actual, actual answer is found in Luke 12, where Jesus says, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would it be that it were already kindled? I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it's accomplished. And Jesus saying, the reason it doesn't happen on them is because the fire actually ends up coming on me. I take the punishment for them. Fire in biblical imagery always means the judgment of God. And Jesus says, he came to bring fire on earth. Why didn't fire come on the Samaritans, on the soldiers? The fire ultimately came on Jesus. He was baptized. He was immersed in the judgment of God. He got what you and I deserved. Think about the Old Testament. Remember the things that we learned when we went through the series on Hebrews about the priests and sacrifices? When people wanted to atone for their sins and to be forgiven, they would bring a sacrifice and they would put it on an altar and then the priest would burn it with fire. The problem was you'd have to keep bringing animals over and over and over again because none of those sacrifices would permanently deal with the issue of sin in our lives. And so those Old Testament fires, those Old Testament sacrifices were pointing to this sacrifice. It didn't come down on the Samaritans and it didn't come down on the soldiers and friends. It didn't come down on you and me because it came down on Jesus. He came to take it. He came to bear it. He was rejected so that you and I could be accepted. We rejected him and yet he doesn't turn back and reject us. Jesus was rejected for us. He came to be rejected. He came to be killed. Friends, this is the secret to the change in our identity. Because you and I have to be amazed and captured by the fact that Jesus took our fire, took our punishment, took our condemnation for us. This is the key to this entire conversation. Here's why. You cannot change your identity without a radical experience of God's mercy without a radical experience of God's grace, without a radical experience of God's love. Let me take this a step further. You cannot sit here and say, you know what, I should just change my identity. I'm just going to do more stuff for Jesus. I'm going to build my identity on God. You can't simply change your identity by simply deciding. It's not an act of the will. You can't just say, I'm having a problem all my life because I built my life on the expectation of my parents and, and I built my life on the expectations of my career, my identity on my career or accomplishments. You can't do that. This is, that's not transformation. That's just simply acting. Your heart isn't a computer in which you just simply change the program and reprogram it. There's only one way that the root of your personality will be changed, and that is by experiencing the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus. Only when your heart experiences love from a new source beyond anything that is ever known will your heart begin to move toward that source and begin to be deeply changed. So can I ask you, has your heart been moved? Have you been captured by the love of Jesus until you are melted by the amazing sight, knowledge, and sense of Jesus taking that fire for you, you cannot have a transformation of your identity. 
It has to be an experience of love. Your career cannot buy it for you. Your portfolio cannot obtain it for you. Your loved ones cannot get it for you. Jesus is saying, don't give the title deed of your heart to anyone else or anything else but me. Don't have any other master but me because I'm the only one that has promised to never leave you. And even if you fail me, I will never abandon you because I'm faithful even when you are unfaithful. When all your stuff disappears, you know what's still remaining? It's Jesus. When people disappoint you and fail you, what's remaining is Jesus. When you're hurt and you're sick, what's there constant is Jesus. Why? Because he can't go back on his word. He says, I'll never leave you. Everything else will fade. Everything else will disappoint. Everything ultimately will fail you. But Jesus says, I won't. So you need all three to be, if you want to be a disciple of Jesus. There must be this experience of this radical mercy which leads you to a new identity, which helps such a new priority. That being said, let me give you three practical things about being a disciple of Jesus. Number one, hear me, disciple, discipleship is not an option. Discipleship is not an option. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to hear this, and you need to hear this strong. Discipleship is not an option. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must follow me. If you want to come after me, if you want to have any experience of me, any relationship with me, you have to be my disciples. There aren't two kinds of Christians, disciples and regular Christians. There is only one. To, be a, if, to say that you are a Christian means that you are a disciple of Jesus. To have anything to do with Jesus means to follow him in a way that he defines it, not that way that you define it. Setting a new priority, finding a new identity, experiencing living in a new mercy. Discipleship is not an option. And can I invite you, can I encourage you? All of us need two people in our lives. We need someone to be pouring into us to encourage us, someone that's discipling us. And all of us need to be discipling someone else. We need to find people that we could say, hey, can I talk to you about Jesus? Can I encourage you in your walk with Jesus? We all do. We need someone in our lives that will constantly pour into us and say, hey, keep going. Keep striving. Keep pushing. Keep following Jesus. Because if we don't, the only voice we're going to be listening to is ourselves. And the last person I want to listen to is myself. Because I'll buy a bunch of lies about myself. Either I'll think I'm too good and I'm okay, or I'll think I'm too bad and not worthy. And so I need other people in my life to speak into me. Friends, this is not done, meant to be done alone. Your walk with Jesus is not meant to be you and Jesus. That's not there. If that was the case, Jesus should have just raptured you to heaven the moment you got saved. But he didn't. He put you into community. He put you into family, and he says, you need one another. And so just showing up on church Sunday morning is not enough. It's saying, hey, come into my life. Walk with me. Journey with me. When I'm struggling, you're there for me. When I'm I'm hurting, you're there. Because I need you to speak the gospel truth into my life to remind me that Jesus is with me, will not fail me. And I also need you to tell me when I don't have my act together. Because that would be the most un-Christian thing to do is you let me screw my life up and not speak into me. Not speak into me because you're afraid of what I would think. You need people in your life. I need people in my life. We need that. Number two, discipleship is a journey. Verse 51, Jesus writes how Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. And at that moment, he begins his journey to the cross. And as he's journeying to the cross, knowing that this journey is going to lead him to his death, he begins to start teaching about discipleship. This is Luke's way of saying that discipleship is a journey. In other words, there's a decisive point. You have to leave. To go on a journey means that I take my hands off my life. To go on a journey means I give up the right to live my life the way I want to live it. To go on a journey means saying, I'll obey you, Lord, and I'll get rid of 
all the ifs of my life that I normally make when I start that sentence. No, obey you if. No, I'll just obey you. You drop your conditions. You drop your requirements. See, until you get to that point, you really haven't begun the journey. But let me also say that after you begin, it's still a journey. It's a process that takes time. You're not going to have it all together. And friends, it's important for you to keep that in mind. Because if you think discipleship is the way that you're saved, that by being committed and focused and giving Jesus the priority, you're going to please God, that you, that you will get saved, you're missing the point. Look at the order. Jesus doesn't say, if you follow me, I'll go to the cross for you. He's saying, I'm going to the cross for you, so follow me. You're not saved because you're a disciple. You're a disciple because you've been saved. And so if, you're, if you've been saved, this should be part of your life. Final thing. The sign of a true growing disciple of Jesus is that they're gentle. It's amazing that the disciples, when the disciples, that the disciples, when the disciples talk about wanting to burn down the people that rejected Jesus, they were actually trying to so show Jesus how intensely committed they were to Jesus. They were showing, look how much we love you. We're so willing to pray for our enemies to be burned down. And Jesus says, you don't get it at all. You see this all the time, especially when someone is passionate about something, whether it's religion or politics, especially this year, or theology. You're so passionate about their cause that you don't just promote your idea, you actually spew hate on everyone else that's different from you. Look at the political system. It's not about promoting what you are convinced about. It's about saying and calling out people and attacking people that are, believe differently from you. You spew hatred toward people because why do you do that? Because you're overly passionate about what we believe. And because of that, you're hard on other people. But friends, the gospel is different. The harder yourself, the harder you are on yourself, and you understand the depth of the gospel's work in your life, that Jesus would save a sinner like me. And you soak in that and you rest in that and you find your identity in that. The, the more you see the power and the impact of the gospel that Jesus has rescued you, the easier you become on other people. Jesus is basically saying, hey, my people, they're not terrorists. My disciples are saved by grace so that when they look at other people who are doing right, they don't say, we're so much better than them. We're committed to you, aren't we? But they say, Jesus saved them by the same grace that he saved us. You become gentle. Jesus says to his disciples there, you don't get it. You haven't had a transformation of identity because you have not understood my mercy. You don't know what I've done for you because as yet you can't, but someday you will. The truth is these disciples were probably racist. They're calling fire down on who? The Samaritans. You don't hear them calling fire down on the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were calling, being radical to Jesus or hating Jesus. But it was these people that were different from them. But this is the first time any of his followers, this is the first time any of his followers wanted fire to come down. There's racism there. There's also definitely self-righteousness there. Superiority, bigotry, rudeness, harshness, they all go away the more you become a disciple of Jesus. They go away as you become aware the fire that Jesus took for you and as it becomes a central, of your, central part of your life. And that's a sign that you're not trying to save yourself, that you're not just being religious, but the gospel has transformed you and made you into more and more like Jesus. So I ask you, are you gentle in the way that you respond to people are you full of grace 
would you spew hatred on people that are different than you? Are you more tolerant? Are you more gracious with people around you? Are you more kind? I invite you. We're going to love you, the, all of you into a brand new identity. And he'll give you exactly what you need. Can I again share that my prayer is that each of us would be disciples of Jesus. More than you being here and giving a lot of money or more than you being here and volunteering in a bunch of places, more than you being here so the pews are filled, my prayer is that our, each of our lives, we would be people that say, Jesus first, Jesus only. That we would be people that say, we are so in love with Jesus in such a way that we would be listening to his voice every day. That we would be saying, Jesus, what do you want me to do today? How do you want me to live? That we would be people of community that's saying, hey, walk alongside of me so that I become more and more like Jesus. So would you pray that with me? Would you pray that even into your own life, that you simply wouldn't be satisfied with showing up on Sunday morning, but that you would be intentional of saying, Jesus, you gave your life for me. I want to live my life for you. I want to live my life in such a way that you are honored.